Okay, we cited uh, Harrison Lake and the fossils, uh, and fossil academies and the fossils, and I also have to stress is this is sort of like a photographic record of uh, my times on the west side of Harrison Lakes and some of the fossils you see and some of the ventures we actually have here and especially want to emphasize on changing. So these are the types of fossils you will see on the west side of uh, Harrison Lakes that are very typical and I'd like to actually stress afterwards is uh, after the presentation we actually have fossils here uh, and also latex molds done by Rod Bradford and also other people that have bought fossils today that you can actually look at some of these actual specimens. Um, Next slide. Uh, next. And so uh, this is actually one of my first 
fossil trips in uh, 1998 at Hale Creek. And uh, there's a picture of Rene Stavenhoff. And he was one of them, uh, not quite a, a founding member, but a very active member. And he actually retired quite early in age as a key school teacher in high school. He taught science. And for him, he was a really great fossil collector and had a huge amount of fossils. When he passed away in 2005, he actually contributed some of his fossils and donated them, actually his wife donated them, to the Royal BC Museum in Victoria. Mm -hmm. um, so this is actually the, here on this side, this is the uh, cliff site near Pale Creek. It's just right on the logging road. And here's another side of that thing. But, so you'll actually see a lot of green green trees that actually grown here. Uh, there's this young woman, Mia, and she actually has this rock with the Hadassus. Those are the names of the Amites. That's their species name. Uh, and there's a variety of types of Hadassus that are there. And so that's one that's there right now. And again, this area, a mysterious formation, is mid-Jurassic. I've got the rocky time period. It's about 165 million years ago. Okay, now we go to Broken Back Hill, and so this is actually as you were approaching the Broken Back Hill right over here, and actually this is it right here. Okay. Yeah, this is a little location. Okay, lower. Okay, that's right. It's really early. Position lower. Okay, so it's 135 to roughly about 90 million years ago, uh, and so we actually drive close to Broken Back Hill, and then to come across this site right over here, and we're looking at this uh, Belonite uh, Pumpina, and also lots of um, Bukia uh, here. The, so they're referred as plants for bivalve, and they're all about uh, roughly lower cretaceous in the age. Okay, uh, next. Okay, just uh, talk about a little bit about Amex, uh Cardosterus, and so their fragments are extremely common. Every rock that you see, that they're, they're fragmentary. And sometimes you get sort of like the uh, mold uh, of the uh, ammonites, but lots of them tend to be fragmented. I mean, this one is just half there, and that's actually pretty good. But most you get little pieces of them um, all. So these ones actually are uh, ones that I've collected down here, and they're more complete. And you can actually see uh, some examples over here, uh, much more mature specimens of the Oscars. And these tend to be quite rare. Um, and so you start almost like lucked out in finding some of these. I mean, I took a group of people and uh, they asked me, well, what are we looking for here? Pale Creek. And so I just grabbed a random rock and so I said, this is the rock we're supposed to look at. And I just turned it over and said, oh, there's a whole Colossus that was actually <laughs> on there. And they said, oh, well, you, you put it there, there and you. And so uh, it was just luck of the draw. Um, I like actually like to say when it comes fossil collecting, uh, I'll find something that's roughly about 30 percent, and 70 percent is all this much. Not great stuff. Okay, uh, next. Okay, uh, a little bit about Cadoxus. Like, who's the relatives of Cadoxus? They're the Ammonites, and Ammonites are now extinct, but they belong in a group called the Cephalopods, and these are some of the Cephalopods that exist today. Okay, some of them, giant octopus, okay, that's the one uh, animal that has uh, eight arms. And these are all invertebrates, that means they don't have a backbone. Okay. And this example, brief squids, okay, um, so they actually have eight arms and two tentacles here. And same with the cuttlefish, and that's all eight arms and two tentacles, okay. And these are the major groups of cephalopods that exist today. And also, we can also include the chambered nautilus, and this is actually a picture. Uh, I'm afraid that see, it was taken in sort of a dark tank, and this is actually live nautilus that was uh, pictures of that Waikiki Aquarium called Wai. And so I was actually quite uh, uh, taken by seeing them alive. Uh, they didn't do too much other than I came back and seen one on one side and then one on the other side, and just noticed it had moved, but I didn't get to see them move. But they're just sitting in the tank, uh, floating around. There's nothing for them to eat in the tank, and that's because they don't want to put in anything plastic or anything like that, big coral, because they'll start to munch on that. I think that's why this tank 
looks very barren. And mm -hmm. I've seen that thing happen uh, with sea turtles, even though they're there also in the tank. Sometimes they'll put items in there because you don't have them eating the plastic coral. So that's why it's uh, called empty. And also these animals are quite deep um, in the oceans. So they're not found around here. So some are found in sort of the tropical uh, mid-Pacific regions. And uh, they live quite deep, so way below 200 meters. Uh, sometimes uh, they do come in shallow water, but they spend most of the time during the day uh, down in their depths uh, during the day. Uh, okay, next. Okay, uh, there's some examples of amides that have been found in uh, BC. Um, so a lot of the uh, amides actually see their more sort of coiled snail shells too, like this one right over here. Um, you get quite large ones here. Uh, this one is actually we call the Fermi Giant. This is actually mold that was actually done by a rod uh, Bartlett here. And so he did that one for the GSC. And there was also another one here, and this is actually from uh, uh, Qualcomm Beach there, uh, Rain Beard, that she has a museum there. You can actually see that on display. Uh, unfortunately, the one at the GSC is not on display. Okay, it's actually in the basement. Okay, uh, this one actually is from uh, a specimen that's on display and it's actually done by the Vancouver uh, Island Genetological Society. And so they actually uh, loan the specimens there to the uh, Pacific Museum of the Earth on loan to actually have display on there. So this is a place where you can actually see uh, real animals here that are not cast in And they have heteromorphic uh, animals. These are the ones that sort of almost look like corkscrew. It almost like a tightly wound uh, chamber, but they have been uncoiled. There may be some of the paper things. And so they come from a variety of shapes and also a variety of sizes, some of them. And so some of the amides get much more larger than the furry jack we have here. Uh, next. Uh, yes? Okay, so you're yeah, I've actually heard like the tires on some of the big dump trucks that they actually use to uh, do strip mining, that size. So they get even larger than that. That's what I heard. I haven't seen one specimen like that. Yeah. Um, here's always some of the models uh, from, uh, and also illustrations showing this is how you analyze. Okay. So here's one that was done by uh, Rod Hartman here. And this is actually one that actually you can see at the Vilco Survey of Canada up in the library. It is on display, and so I've done this actually. I go to the library, it doesn't cost anything. And they have wonderful fossils, animals that you can actually see, and some interactive uh, things that actually they have there. Uh, this one here in the bottom here, this is from the Vancouver Island in the Corky Museum on display there, and they have a beautiful diagram that shows you all the animals and also uh, what the seas would have looked like back then. Uh, these two are Ray Troll's illustrations right here. Uh, you'll notice that see, he has thin picture of eight arms and uh, two tentacles. And now, uh, uh, I talked to Rod about uh, his model here, and so he hasn't found any evidence of them having any tentacles. So he, he strongly believes they actually have eight arms. And so, but uh, the other thing you also do with some toy stores, you can actually buy. Wonderful models of animals. This one right here that's actually also on display the job of Survey Canada. Uh, I bought myself one and it actually, unfortunately, it had two tentacles, which I thought was inaccurate. So what I did was cut the tentacles off to make it accurate. <laughs> and so I have done that. So these are all sort of examples uh, of people who picture what the animals are. And see, this one actually Rachel's here so to uncoil the heteromorphic animals existing in the midwater. We really don't know if they lived on midwater, some people have suggested maybe they were living on the bottom. So um, hopefully it's we find more evidence of exactly what the lifestyle was like. Uh, next. Okay, uh, based on our lifestyles and the habits of the animals that are now extinct, and they became extinct about 65 million years ago, the same time period when the asteroid hit the Earth and killed off the dinosaur, marine reptiles, and also flying reptiles, and also uh, a lot of other things that actually existed uh, during 
through the business owner. So uh, here we have the chamber goddess. And so they actually will live in a shell. And one of the very few cephalopods that actually live in a shell too. And so you'll see here, um, lower over here, a uh, shell of Nautilus. And you'll see a lot of these in shell shops. And so if you took an x-ray of a Nautilus shell or cut it in half, you actually see it has something called a spot And so this is the way the animal can control its state. Points. So uh, it's almost like a miniature submarine. They can actually add a little bit of gas or fluid and adjust their buoyancy because they're, they're going uh, up into the shallows at night and that's in the same depth with depth uh, during uh, the daytime. And so they remain there. So they have to adjust themselves almost like a submarine. So their, their shell is designed to actually handle the building pressures as they go either. Uh, and down deeper into the water and also changing the pressure of the go uh, slight up. So they're actually able to do that. Okay, next. Okay, that shows you the Jurassic World and uh, how it does this. And so you see a lot of the continents. Uh, the Atlantic Ocean is beginning to actually spin up. Uh, the uni United Continent, known as Pangea, is now splitting up. So South America and Africa are splitting apart, and also Europe and also North America are starting to split up, forming the Atlantic Ocean. So this is how it looked there. And so uh, BC would have been somewhere around this area, and it didn't exist at the time. It slowly actually built. So it may have been what people think is groups of islands that are actually out there, uh, in BC coast. And so Jurassic theory times. Where we're standing right now would have been all ocean or south seas. Okay, uh, next. And so uh, the other animal that we find out uh, at the next Bukiai site uh, is Cadosphorus, also known as the clams, too. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, I always say on our field trips, if you can't find a Cadosphorus at Amlai, you're guaranteed to find this in some clams in Bukiai. And so there's always these guys there, and I kind of like it because uh, someone who hasn't found anything, at least they can find in the movie. And so they probably were some types of filter feeding plants, so they're taking water, filtering all the food particles, just like the oyster here, uh, Pacific oyster that's still around today. And so they must have been sort of like in groups and on walks. And eventually, some of these were actually were, uh, died from these long legs layers of these. Yeah. yeah, so this is the uh, world of the Bukiai, and so it's a uh, more efficacious. And at that time here, you did see the North America split off from Europe, the Atlantic Ocean, sort of coming off the Atlantic Ocean, has formed as South America splits from uh, Africa. And then, let's see, in the middle here, uh, that splits way down is the Western Inland uh, Seaway, which mm -hmm. actually covered probably from Alaska down to the Gulf of Mexico, the Shadow Sea. And so that's where it'll actually split down uh, across the bits of Alberta and also Saskatchewan there. And meanwhile, here on our west coast, where you see is uh, in front of this pretty much shallow seas around here. Okay. Uh, next. So this example is from uh, Green Bear, who lives in these books. Uh, Vancouver Island apostles. So this thing shows you uh, what would have been there uh, in the shallow seas. And so this is actually sort of like uh, uh, seas would have moved around uh, Vancouver Island. So we have cuttlefish, green reptiles, sharks, and also amphites. And so on the bottom would be shellfish. And these things uh, are very similar to some clams that exist as fossils today. And that's all the things that see uh, the heteromorphic ammonites and also even lobsters. And there's different ones, okay? Uh, we also have the Lasmosaur, um, mm -hmm. another type of marine reptile, not a dinosaur. And so uh, they also existed uh, on Vancouver Island. And so you have a chance to actually go to the Courtney Museum. And it is worth going there to actually see what type of marine life exists in the ancient oceans there. And again, we have the Amites here, and also the presence of sharks, and also some uh, 
fast that I've actually lived on the ocean before. Uh, next. Okay, we also find the uh, Belenites that are there. And so they tend to be sort of almost these cigar shaped type of invertebrates. That are there. And you see them there, they're all cigar shaped. And you have to scout the root of there. And some of them are actually quite small, and the other ones tend to be a little bit larger. Uh, but most of them tend to be quite small. Okay, uh, next. Okay. And they have actually found fossils, belenites. And the one that she right over here, this is probably a very accurate model because they actually have the entire belenite, I would think, preserved in the rocks, including the its, its ink uh, sac too. And so they already know that they had eight arms, you know, tentacles, and they couldn't find any on there. And instead of suckers, like today's squids, um, some of today's squids do have hooks, but the elements all had hooks on all their eight arms. So they didn't have any suckers, they all had hooks. So they must have had like a similar type of lifestyle like what squids have today. And so here's another model right here down below here, um, down like, and here's uh, the squid here, they were very similar in terms of lifestyles. So they do be these ones were probably living in mid water, uh, right above the bottoms, and they also provide food for a lot of marine reptiles and large fish. Okay, uh, next. Yeah, uh, in uh, 2003 and 2004, uh, to the Hale Creek site, I actually came across these mineral claims. And so these mineral claims were actually hosted, and actually, they actually well, claim the fossils and a mineral claim. So at that time, uh, fossils were listed as minerals. Now today, they're listed as heritage. And so they're now becoming very important for the problems of the BC that's now part of the heritage. But uh, this is listed for a few years. Um, I talked with um, some of the people the Fan KS group, and you know, uh, they were actually saying, well, you know, the Bukiai site they also had the same claim, and by the same person, they do believe, and this person decided to make a mineral thing. I mean, most likely he wanted to exploit the fossils that were there and make some type of market, which we would think they were, uh, that's what they thought this person was doing. And one of the people had seen my Fan KS uh, suggested that it was very kind of uh, not the best thing to do at the Hale uh, Creek site because Amex, there are very few to get complete. That's probably why he wanted them. So we just said, uh, okay, you know, good luck on that type of business. And um, this existed for about, uh, about a year or two. Um, and then it sort of like disappeared. The whole post were all gone. Okay, next slide. And so now we come to 200, uh, 2017. And so this is how the uh, site looks at Hale Creek. Uh, you notice it's all overgrown where all the cliffs are now. And so it's really not the easiest thing to actually get access to the site. But um, this area here was all full of trees, now it's completely clear cut. You can actually climb from here up to the top of the way up to this hill. And here's Brendan actually, you can scale how big it is. And this area here used to be uh, Pretty good place we actually find some uh, Pterosaurus. Um, it's now heavily grown, overgrown, and so it's slowly being exposed to the again, and so people are collecting. One thing I noticed is there were forest fires the year before, and this is actually some of the evidence of some of the fires that happened there. And then you come along, trees along the edges in the back, in front of where Brendan standing, and they're all scorched trees, and so that's where they were sort of a big, massive uh, forest fire that actually happened there. Next. Yeah, and this is actually underneath all this brush necking, and you have to go underneath and dodge some of these logs that are actually hidden there. And so this is some of the animites that uh, Brendan had collected along the cliff over here. And so basically, you can actually chip off the rock, but you know, he found some good ones just by, you know, overturning some of the rocks down below here and just looking for the Alex. And uh, that's also a good technique when you're actually looking for some of these. Um, you can't actually go and actually hit the rocks. And these are actually rocks that are siltstone. 
And so it's not like they come in nice layers, like shale. Or, um, they tend to come in blocks, and they seem to break, break in all directions. And one thing I've often noticed is sometimes they smell this odor of gunpowder. And so this is a site where you actually, I recommend, if you're working on a site, to actually wear some kind of eye protection mm -hmm. and hand protections too. Um, because I've actually been um, hitting some of these rocks and actually I see small pieces that actually slice into my hand. That's mm -hmm. happened before. Mm -hmm. And so I make sure it's the almost wearing gloves. It slows down the process when you're actually going there. It's actually very really be protective if you're looking for this. Okay. Um, in terms of animal life, I've never seen except birds here, this thing was um, at this scale of uh, many years ago, they actually had a black bear. And so I have never seen anything, I don't see any Sasquatch, I've never seen um, a lot of Okay, next. Okay, um, at the Hale Creek site, we also get some uh, bizarre types of uh, bivalves here. And these ones are collected by Brandon, and so some of them are these sort of like, uh, it looks almost like uh, freshwater clam, that's the first thing I got. They would say something almost like a cockroach. And so you get all these little bizarre types of um, uh, bivalves, and including this is something that looks like bookie eye. And so uh, these tend to be sort of just a newer things that you find amongst all these uh, animals that are there. Uh, next. Uh, sorry, what are the brachiopods in this? Oh, sorry, no brachiopods at all. There's no, they're all bivalves. I've never seen a bracket pod actually in there. I don't know if anyone has like there to be bracket pods in, but that's, you know, that's a good thing. And so just, uh, everyone tells, uh, just for a fresh anyone's knowledge of what a bracket pod is, uh, these are also called lamp shells. And so uh, they're different from the bivalves. They tend to have the same life type, but both of them also feel their feet. But with bracket pods, uh, they tend to be having when you have a bracket pod and shells that has two halves, one's on top of the other, and you split them this way, you get a near change. Okay. With the bivalves, the clams, you split them down with their open this way here, then you get two mini -changes. Yeah. So it's sort of like the, the two halves of the two valves, those are the clams, and they're related to the mollusk clams. Uh, the bracket pods, they're in their little own group, they, they have a pencil here. They look clam like not related to the plants at all. And so when you split them in half this way, you get two identical halves. The both halves are mirror images. So that's one difference. And usually the top shell is bigger than the lower shell. And they usually attach to the seed floor by using the stalk of something called a padunk. And that makes the difference between the uh, clams and also the rapid pods. So none of the clams have a padunk. No, you may, you'll see muscles being attached, but they use a different technique. They use something called bristle threads to actually attach. So they're not using the dumbbell at all. They're just using something they produce from the foot, bruise, and themselves uh, on the ball. So that's the difference between the bracket pod and the uh, So uh, now we're at the uh, bookie eye site, and it's pretty much the same. Um, it hasn't changed at all. Maybe there might be a few rocks eroding. And, um, some of the things uh, Dr. Danner, um, he spoke to us about uh, and mentioned that a lot of the boot cats that you see there, there's not actually a layer there, which we call a uh, boot layer. Okay. They're always classified as peninsular formation. So he thinks that, um, he mentioned to me that somehow the glaciers scraped off these boot somewhere far up north. And so we were talking about maybe around uh, roughly about 20, 10,000 years ago, and just drop all these bootyas everywhere in North America. So we get these six layers, and it looks like this whole area is like the uh, bootyas mother lobe layer, but it's all been dropped there by the glaciers. Uh, next, uh, one thing I should mention. Uh, person of a society, uh, Ken Norman, um, he was actually with his nephews uh, out uh, collecting bukia, and so they were having lunch one time, and one of the nephews had mentioned, what's this 
and looked at that and it turned out to be a marine reptile. And so this is actually him holding um, the uh, Clarison Lake uh, ichthyosaur, and the ichthyosaur was identified as a Betsy nickel, so it's just a fragmentary type of thing. So you see here in the uh, middle here, this is the vertebrae, and these are bone fragments here, bone fragments here, so it's not like looking at those bones, um, Dr. Nichols could actually identify what species it has. And so um, it, it just shows you just by the birth rate that she knew that this was the weakness. And so we joke around every time there at uh, the Bukia site, you know, just look out for that marine reptile. And you know, lately I've been there and I see some things almost looks like bone, but I'm not sure what I'm looking at is that bone is actually wood. So uh, this is one thing that we still keep our eyes open. And there's a ruler that actually shows you how big uh, these vertebrae are. Okay, uh, next. Uh, this is a scale of grief that I'm back in just last year, 2022. And so this is a site that I actually saw before. Um, and it's, it's, it's changed a little bit. Um, they actually have sort of like a creek running through that site. And the traffic there, I don't know uh, what's happening there, but it seems like a lot of off-road traffic. It seems like every year it increases and increases. I've never seen any so much traffic going there. It seems like every 15 minutes there's always a vehicle passing by us. And we see a group of vehicles going past us and the same vehicles coming down. And so there's some type of off-road group that actually use the road and they just do journeys back to work. And so a lot of these people do stop off and ask us what we're doing here. They just have to work possible. And they see them and they just say, oh well, yeah, I plan to do something before they tell them. You know, you go further ahead and get to plan to get, you know, about the place. Um, one thing also to the uh, left of this road is this huge terrace that actually constructed here, and you know, so you can see it here. So this is the main logging road, and they just made this huge terrace right over there, and you actually can look, um, here we have uh, Hanson, uh, he's actually cracking open some bukia, they found this big block of bukia, and he's cracking it open. Uh, there's another picture of the logging road there, and then off the side there, they just constructed this huge terrace, which is just full of fragmentary and also complete uh, Amites there, there's a group picture of uh, the last group of people that actually went in there. And so we know that see there's a lot of tractor treads uh, around here, so they reconstructed uh, the entire world. Now, in, when I showed you the claim sign, it was actually spread somewhere here. That's actually the old boat that actually went down the cliff somewhere on that side. So it, it's gone now, completely. It, it's gone. And also the claim expired. Uh, next. And that's what you ignore the Hale Creek sign. And so that all that bush that was there, all those logs, it's been scraped clean. And it's all gone. You can actually see bits of layering in here. Uh, most of the and they also redid the road. So any of the material from the cliff they actually went down here down the creek. Uh, I never did have a chance to actually go down and explore the creek. Um, but there seems to be lots of material here on the side of the road. A lot of the rocks I can recognize down here, so it tends to be a sort of dark gray, almost black type of rock here. And again, as we have uh, lots of much traffic, you can actually see how smooth the cliffs are here. It's all been scraped away, and it also a gigantic glacier uh, came just scraped off everything here. So it's almost like scraped almost smoothly. And so I, I never had a chance to actually look at these rocks here, but some of them look pretty fresh. Okay, uh, next presentation slide. Okay. Um, just to mention uh, a few things that, uh, and ending that to your presentation, uh, 1920, uh, sorry, 2018 and 2019, there was this sort of, you can go online and try to decide which candidate uh, these fossils could be designated as a potential fossil. And one of them was uh, an amylite here. And so uh, Canadosaurus uh, here uh, was one of the candidates, the only candidates of amylite uh, 
uh, that actually was in part of this provincial fossil. Um, I cheated, I actually went to one computer and then voted for the analyte and went to another computer <laughs> and did it. So I actually uh, put a check that I really wanted the analyte to be nominated uh, as it. And so what it turned out to be a uh, candidate for this um, number of people that found it appealing, uh, 11%, and it came in third place next to uh, Eo Samuel and Driftwoodia, which one of the early salmon that they actually find fossils of uh, in Driftwood Canyon. Uh, came around 10%. But the big candidate that actually got the most vote was the uh, elastosaur, which I actually showed you a picture of. And so that's the one along with the four flippers. Uh, right now, it's not officially a provincial fossil. Um, from what I understand, they're still in the process of uh, making it official. That's the last word I hold. I've heard about that. And people are probably saying, well, why is it taking so long when there's a lot of politics? They are busy with other things that are more important on their agenda rather than some extinct uh, primitive, not living reptile. And so that, that's one reason is why it's been so slow for. Hopefully they don't forget to actually make it official. Okay, um, next slide. Yeah, uh, this is actually a the original Vancouver Technological Society brochure that I designed. Uh, and so it, we decided actually on two uh, Don Redwood, the Minnesota leaves on both sides, with Cadosphorus, which I tried to actually reproduce. I think it's pretty much, um, uh, there's a lot, a lot of artistic errors, I can say, on this Cadosphorus, because what I did is just based it on a circular type of amylite shell. So it actually was one of our original Amylites actually we used on the brochure, and actually they lived on our brochures for a long time, but slowly it started changing to more stylized type of amylites. And so I just want to mention that one day. It was part, used to be part of our, uh, on our brochures. Okay, uh, next. Okay, uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much uh, for watching this presentation. So I have pictures of the ear of the uh, amylites and also some of uh, the chamber of the shells. And so um, there's also a lot of other adventures that they had there in uh, Paris and Lake. Uh, for example, I actually saw heli logging there for the first time. And when we were at the Bukia site, we actually had an ice cream truck come and visit us. And actually, to prove it was an illusion, uh, one of the people that were with us actually bought one of the popsicles from this ice cream truck. And that was only not only one time, I actually saw uh, two other times where we were there, ice cream trucks coming down of the bush. And they had the music playing. And from what I was told is there is a big uh, scout jamboree that captain flew the rock roll. And so they have sent their ice cream trucks to go visit these uh, scouts and actually provide them with ice cream. Uh, so I have time for any questions, and thank you very much for all those people on Zoom who came to actually join us for this meeting. Uh, feel free to actually send any of their questions, um, either talk to me uh, verbally or send them on the uh, queries. Um, they didn't have any questions today. Uh, yeah, we can have the lights on, please, Rob. Well. Yes. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for that presentation. That was wonderful. Uh, the, uh, the road going up there, uh, are there seasonal aspects to it when they, they work on it and the road improves? And when are the better times to, to go up there? Uh, the earliest you can go there is probably late March. Uh, some of us have, from what they said, they've gone there in early March. There's still snow up there. Mm -hmm. And so that can create a problem. Uh, there's also a chance of heavy rain, which we can probably know we get here in the whole mainland. And so it might cause like large puddles there. And so there tend to be sort of like um, just a lot of water. And you also have to watch that sometimes the roads, there's a chance that they can I've actually seen huge potholes here as created by other vehicles. And so you never know how deep these potholes are until you actually go over it. Um, I think I cracked my uh, tailpipe there, uh, or muffler. Um, going to Harrison, because I think I bumped it and cracked it in half. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we actually were talking with some people here where 
people who actually damage their tires and actually have their tires replaced uh, on the road. So sometimes like sharp rocks, you can come across them on the road. Uh, my advice is actually not to go too fast on these, keep it at three kilometers, although I've actually seen people with off-road vehicles and even regular vehicles doing more than 30 kilometers. And you know, um, I didn't include in this presentation, but you'll come across a lot of burnt vehicles on the side of the road. I think there's one or two when you're going up that I've noticed. And so those people, I guess they, you're either uh, drunk or driving too fast and they're on the edge. And so those are recommendations I can actually tell people, you know, take your time and let the other people who are just speeding around, let them go through and just take your time and just be safe. There is enough room on some of these larger roads you can actually uh, move off and let them pass. Uh, I don't recommend anyone going there during weekdays. It seems like the logging trucks are operating during the weekdays. Uh, I've never been there during the weekdays, but this is what I've heard. Um, there are no roads where you can only just have one vehicle. They're all pretty wide enough for a uh, public road. Two logging trucks actually pass by. And so that's actually some of the advice I can give to you. And also, uh, it is an area where you can actually see um, bears. And I've had black bears come to some of our foster uh, children. We never had a problem other than the young, curious ones we sometimes get. And they haven't learned that to probably be afraid of them. They're just basically curious. Mm -hmm. I've seen these people digging in the ground and they go, oh, maybe they may have some food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's pretty much all about the bicycle. So uh, I can continue until uh, late October, and then we can get a little snow. And so when you get a little snow down here in Low Man, but when around there in Harrison, it's quite high, no shadow falls. Probably up there. I've never been there in the winter time, but I don't want to have to take a chance to actually visit the site in November. Mm -hmm. Great. So it's a quick question. I wonder if you organized a field trip at all amongst five um, members. Yeah, we do, and so um, the society members once we come, uh, all these field trips are for the society members. Uh, we can take some non-members in case. We usually have them sign waiver forms for all the BCPA uh, groups. So it includes also the Vancouver Island Pentecost Society, um, the Vancouver uh, Museum Society, and also uh, Victoria Anthropological Society. Uh, they also have the same system just in case you want to see us in case something you know, someone gets hit by a rock. Um, in this Hale Creek, I've actually seen people being hit by rocks. And it's usually because one person is pouring above the other person. Mm -hmm. And so um, being hit by some of these rocks, some of these rocks are huge. Um, this log, they'll be about like this big, and that's actually going to be caused by some injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, we do actually make arrangements, and so most likely, probably this year, we'll probably be heading there. Probably Harrison, uh, late, and probably in late March, uh, probably do that. And so from March <coughs> to uh, October, we usually have field trips because uh, usually those are kind of the rest of the time it always covers up, and that's why we have them in the middle. Uh, I noticed the Victoria, they send the have their field trips like year round, and also the Vancouver, the island of Canada. Uh, they have their, or they also have field trips. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Any other questions? Yeah, are these sites accessible like, in a small car, or do you need an SUV here? No, um, I've actually seen someone through, use their um, uh, Honda Civic on the road, and we actually had someone for the first time, she had an electrical vehicle. Um, and so we actually tell people to make sure you've got to have more hand gas so we can actually get there. One thing I've never tried is go through it past the loop the ice side. I think I did try that um, someone had a van and went further up and you see you go around this little loop and you can't go any further to the loop. And I don't know if we could go on turn, but you know, this they changed the site at Hale Creek and there's a number of roads that are still lead uphill and same the loop side, you see all these roads that go around. Uh, I know that some of these roads, they go down to the shore to uh, Harrison Lake. And so we have gone in the past down to the lake shores 
and we haven't found too much, but something actually that requires more exploring. And same with the Hale Creek is down to the creek. Since seeing all that material that used to be the cliff is now going down the creek, there's probably more stuff down there. I myself I did not want to go there by myself unless I had someone with me because uh, I just don't know what's down there and I don't want to come across it there. Uh, and even if the crew is, I never heard who was there, but you get them in the morning, and so there's probably a chance that I could come across it. I've never heard of anyone from the Harrison area seeing the And so those are things that the two things I worry about. Okay, any other questions? Anyone from uh, online? Yes, yes, Terry. Let me let me put Dan okay. in one. Okay, Dan. Um, one second. Mary, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, good to have you. I was glad to uh, make him with me tonight. Uh, I missed your last one. Anyways, I just wanted to ask a couple of things. I was kind of interested in the ichthyosaur find up there. That was pretty significant. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I hadn't had realized that. So the ichthyosaurs became extinct in the early Cretaceous, or late Cretaceous, early Cretaceous. And uh, so I was trying to get the timeline of the age of the Hale Creek material. Uh, it's Jurassic, but it's, is it late Jurassic? Yeah, can I answer that one? Sure, yeah. Hey Dan, can you hear me? Yeah. So that was found by Ken Nauman, uh, what was it, early 2000s or something? Yeah, yeah. early 2000s. So that was probably, it was actually from the peninsula formation in Lord yeah. Cretaceous. So the, the age is probably uh, Barasium. So they were around I think these stories were around during that part of the location, but, but quite rare. Yeah, that's that's what I was saying. This was right. the, uh, the earliest Cretaceous, because they died out 90 million years ago. Yeah. So it would, have, it would have been quite significant to know that that was one of the last you know, epic, epic times there for But uh, that's pretty uh, cool. Uh, just want to also say, Yes, and there's quite a few there in the spots, not really as common as the Bukiai, but if you look at some of the places and look really hard, you can come across some uh, bell knights and also some loose ones sometimes, but those are rare. And I did remember seeing uh, some of these uh, bell knights, when they rolled out the rock, they used some of the also a horror hole, and so that's how big, and some of them would be about roughly about this big, so roughly about almost um, two to three centimeters in diameter. So I guess there were some big ones, uh, but you can never tell if it was a geological survey who actually, a uh, worker actually bore that hole, or you're actually looking at a belemite. But I know some of these ones, uh, the bore holes got narrow and narrow, um, so just by looking at that criteria, these were actually belemites that had eroded out the rocks and they just left this mold of a borehole. And so I, I, there's some big ones there, but I haven't seen any ones as fossils. Oh, yeah. You want to show Dan? Yeah, that, Dan. That's the one I found Dan uh, brought me a peel of it. From the yeah. So this one here is one that Rod had done, uh, John Fan. And you found this specimen? Yeah. Okay. okay. And so this is a mold of one, a latex mold, as the crew it is. Uh, <laughs> here. You can bring that closer to the camera. Yeah, and so, uh, this is the 3D effect. It's, right it's right the here. large cylinder of this. So, you oh. can get, I, yeah. And so, that's uh, full length of um, And so, that's actually, that's quite large. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never seen anyone like, like that large. They're usually seen quite small. They tend to be fragmentary. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get them in cross sections. So, they'll be in, like, you'll see them split, like, down there. And they'll go this plane. So, they almost look like eyes looking at. And so they tend to be little circles, and so you get cross sections of these guys in some places. Yeah. Now that yeah. that uh, site I showed you with the uh, Belmite conquina, uh, that site's now gone because the graders that actually did the roads, they totally wiped it out, or it might be buried under all that dirt. I tried looking for it, but I have to do it by walking because I can almost like get a good idea of where that might be. So it's buried on tons of rock and also uh, dirt. So it might be still there, but I don't think it could be. Um, it was always the best site to actually take people and show them the <laughs> Yeah. Okay, 
I actually found that that block where that mold was made was actually quite close to the Jurassic site. Um, it's probably one of those glacial deposits that just got walked or uh, road built, you know, washed out. Uh, another thing I didn't uh, show in my presentation is Brendan has actually a uh, trigonal clan that I actually got um, around the Hale Creek site, but further uphill. And so when you show him that picture slide of him standing there further up as a hill, he actually almost went up to the top there. And that's where he came across uh, the trigonal. And so I didn't include that picture in my Oh, there's one actually here. There's a mold that, and the actual that one. That one right. This one here. Yeah, that's from the Hill Creek. Yeah, this one's from the Hill Creek lower down. Yeah. 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 So this one's a trigonal clam. Yeah. And there's a mold near that. Yeah. yeah. That's probably the gene. That is myoporella, I think. Most, most likely. Okay. Anything else? I have examples of. We can do like yeah. So this is a colostris. Hope it will be mature. Okay, and yeah, so you can see the little cake. Yeah, and so that's how we look. This is this is the aperture. The aperture. Right? Yeah, the aperture. Right. And these that's one of the pretty much as good as you're gonna get. That's what you would likely actually see, get. Um, yeah. I've actually yeah. have one for years at home, yeah. but it's in many pieces because I didn't know I had actually a cadastrus or not. I took my sledgehammer and slammed it right on where the aperture was and it broke in several pieces, which I had to do for a lot of time. Uh, epoxy, and it doesn't look as nice as this guy. <laughs> yeah, this is pretty much the sister site to Jurassic Point, and uh, you know, out there, close, well, they're very close in age. Yeah, I can't remember, uh, few, it's maybe a million years here. Yes, yes. Tapu, Tapu Street, and uh, uh, Tapu Street, uh, Tapu Street uh, one tree island, mm -hmm. uh, where we find, you know, billions of rupees, like an entire shoreline of several acres of rupees suspended together. And there are several different species as well, of the Kia, as well as uh, two species of melamites, the Pacatuthus yeah. and the Cylindratuthus. So they, that's, that's, I think we can compare a few of those Jurassic sites back and forth. And uh, there is a Cretaceous uh, Jurassic boundary that's supposed to make the island that we found. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, uh, really interesting to see what uh, analytes and fossils made it through that uh, event between the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. So it's really very similar material. In some cases, we have lots of pedosterous, beautiful specimens uh, that came out of that site uh, on the island. Do you want to show Dan that phylosophers or parchisophers that Rod had found? So we do get very rare phylos phylosaurus oh, as well from the hill uh, the Sears Creek formation. So this is one I found I okay. found one as well, but that's a phyloceratid. Uh, uh, Kipper yes. identified as a parchisaurus, which is basically a phylosaurus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 